Tonight I'd like to talk about some of the aspects of metta, of loving kindness, some of the dimensions that we begin to uncover, begin to feel when we explore, when we move into this practice. Now, to reiterate something we've already said a few times, to remember that metta can never just be a feeling. It can never just be a feeling. And sometimes we're just having that faith in, in planting the seeds, seeds of intentionality. And that how um, profound, very simple, but profound that is, and powerful. But even when metta is felt as a feeling, and we have a feeling of loving kindness, even then, it's not just one feeling. It's not just one feeling. And I sort of mentioned this in the uh, morning instructions the other day. And you may have noticed this in your practice. When, in those moments, in those times, when there is a feeling, there is something felt in the heart or in the body, we might m- more accurately talk about a constellation of feelings. So sometimes uh, the metta feels warm, it's felt as a warmth. Sometimes it's a kind of bubbly feeling, there's a happiness with it. Sometimes it's very soothing, sometimes calming. Sometimes it's very bright, very luminous. Sometimes very gentle. And the, the loving kind of the, exper- the felt experience of loving kindness can go through all those different textures, different colors, different flavors. It's actually important to feel that. And this is partly why we have this, we keep encouraging this sensitivity uh, that's developing in practice, particularly sensitivity to the body. And just actually allowing the metta to take these subtly different flavors at times, sometimes when it has that feeling, to go through that. Really just allowing that. And... You may also have noticed, many of you may also have noticed by now, sometimes one's doing metta to oneself or metta to the friend or the benefactor, and we are conscious of our suffering or their suffering, and the metta takes on the color, the flavor of compassion at that point. So certainly we, we need to discriminate uh, between these two, between metta and compassion, and get quite specific and precise about what's metta and what's compassion, but they also overlap. And when the metta, uh, as many of you will have experienced already, when it touches suffering, it has the flavor of compassion. And just to allow that, just to allow that, it's part of the, as I said, the constellation of feelings that metta is. Apologies tonight if I'm a little low energy. I'm still um, struggling with an illness, and it seems I've got the better hand this evening. But so there is a, a constellation of, of possible feelings, and we go through these categories that we, we're beginning to unfold. These categories, and so we have uh, the self, the benefactor, the friend, etc. And it's important to recognize that these categories are not fixed. They're not, so you don't kind of, someone is not inherently a friend, or inherently, later we'll do the difficult person or neutral, that they're very fluid categories. So someone might be a benefactor or a friend in that category, and then they say the wrong thing to us. (laughs) And, you know... (laughs) they get uh, relegated <laughs> a couple of divisions. <laughs> and, you know, hopefully, hopefully, uh, they, you know, you heal that and, and they, they get a, you know, promoted again. But they're not, there's nothing fixed. The whole practice is very fluid. The reason for the categories is it's just a technique to gradually extend 
the range of the metta towards this boundlessness, which is the aspiration of the metta. It's just a tool. And we start with the self, and we've, we've, already, we've spent two days with that, and this has already been said, but just to say it again, how common it is, actually, for that to be quite a difficult uh, orientation for the metta, difficult to direct the metta towards the self. Not for everyone, but it's really quite common. And there are all kinds of reasons for this, all kinds of reasons. You know, and we can talk about childhood and family and school and um, many, many possible reasons. And a lot of it, in fact, is just cultural. That, that, that Sometimes looking at the, the culture we're in at the moment, it's almost like there's a bit of a mixed message out there about how one is in relationship to oneself. In many respects, perhaps looking at the culture, we can see that we're in a, a bit of a culture of selfishness. Me first. Maybe a few people around me, but me first. And somehow with that, the, the message from the culture, and some, sometimes it's not even overt, the message is to love oneself, to cherish oneself in a healthy way is somehow selfish. There's, there's quite a confusing message just that we're getting from the culture. But in a way, whatever the reasons, and it can be quite complex, whatever the reasons, we often, or many people, find themselves in a situation where it's quite difficult to direct the, the love towards themselves, the, the intention of love towards themselves. Or even to have an idea or a belief, a view, that it's not a good idea, that it's selfish. And just to have that view. All of that quite complex the the reasons for it but might be just a habit might have just become a habit of viewing a habit of a way of relating to ourself or n- a way of not relating to ourself and as such the, the, the one of the functions of the meta practice is just to weaken that habit weaken that habit so again it's not a very glamorous way of looking at the dharma but it's extremely powerful we're just weakening habits that are unhelpful and it's so necessary. It's so necessary for our lives, for our path, for our practice, to be in the context of love for oneself. But that is the, the inner climate of the way we're moving through our life and, and the way we're moving through our practice. So necessary. And just to repeat, actually, that quote from the Buddha, you know, so powerful you could search the entire universe for someone more deserving of loving kindness than yourself. You will not find that person. You will not find that being. It's something to really reflect on. It's not about what we think we deserve. It's not about what we think we've done or how we think we measure up, what we haven't done, what we said, what we didn't say what goes through our minds, what we think of ourselves. Saying all of that's actually irrelevant. Just the fact of your being means that you deserve it. And to give the love to ourselves is actually a gift to others. It begins to become a foundation from which we can give to others. And actually an indispensable foundation for making that a steady and a deep giving that lasts. So there's the self, and then there's the categories of the friend and the benefactor, which we've done these days. Now, has anyone mentioned the word near enemy yet? No? Okay. Well, people are smiling, so they've heard of it, but in this retreat, has anyone? Well, okay. <laughs> near enemy is a bit of a strange... Uh, concept that comes from, from, from the Buddha, actually. And what it means is something that looks like love, looks like loving kindness, but isn't. It's pretty close, but it isn't. And the near enemy of metta, of loving kindness, is attached love. Now, we all have experienced that. It's n- not unconditional love. So, metta in its aspiration is, it doesn't matter what you do, what you give me back, what you say, whether you're grateful, what you've done, whether I like you, 
None of that. It's unconditional. But usually there are strings and conditions attached to our love, and it's actually attached love. And this is very important because what we find when we begin exploring for ourselves what metta means, what we run into is a lot of this near enemy stuff, a lot of attached love. And the first thing to say is that's totally okay. It's totally normal and okay. We practice with the totality of our humanity. You know, that's what we are, and that's what we bring to practice, and that's what we practice with. And as human beings, of course, well, we are human. We are complex. A lot of our relationships and intentions, there's quite a messiness there. And in a way, that messiness is the stuff of our humanity. And so it's important to enlarge the picture of the practice and just include all that. We're going to run into these near enemies. No question about it. They're actually part of the practice. So not to see them as, no, I give up, you know, or I'm not doing it right. They're actually part of the practice to encounter attached love in the meditation, in the walking, as you go about the day, in your interactions with people, is part of the practice, and actually a necessary part of the practice. Because it's through that that we learn about what near enemy is, but we, <coughs> but we also learn what pure metta is. Without the near enemies, we could never make that journey of learning. So not to regard it as a kind of failure or I'm not getting it right. This is a learning process as much as anything else, and one's beginning to see the different aspects. So today we introduce the friend, the category of the friend, to, to reflect a little bit, I mean, each of us, I think this is really important in our lives, to reflect what does it mean to be a friend? What does it mean to be a good friend in, in this life? And it, actually, there's lots of aspects just to that. Part of it is seeing another. Do we see our friend? Do we really see them? Krishnamurti used to talk about this a lot, how easy it is to just kind of habituate oneself to another, especially when we're very familiar, very intimate with them. And we begin almost to not see them freshly. So I would say an aspiration of friendship, or a fr- what friendship means is to have the aspiration to keep seeing another, to keep seeing them, to keep that fresh, open, not to put another in a box. This goes on all the time in, in the... In, the best of our friendships. It goes on all the time, and it's just a matter of admitting that to ourselves. And again, what does it mean to be a good friend? It means to care about that, and to try and keep breaking that open, and having it be fresh. And that's quite a task. I think it's quite a task. Especially, uh, you know, relationships, friendships, uh, intimate relationships that last years, how easy it is to just gloss over the other. Uh, with time, with familiarity. So that's part of what friendship means, that aspiration. But this is where our humanity in comes in. Also, let's be realistic. If I'm friends with someone, perhaps until we're completely enlightened, completely awakened, I'm also, as much as I want to see the other, I'm going to want to be seen. So that's already attached. You know, there's already some strings attached there. I, I would say, in the context of a friendship, that's okay. You know, that's part of what it is. So what we've got here is something quite human and complex, and not perhaps quite the stainless picture that we might at first seem when we that might at first seem the case when when we come to meta practice. We want to be seen. It's a beautiful thing to feel like you're being seen by a friend. And perhaps that's a necessary part of our friendship and a necessary part of hu- our humanity. How does it feel in a friendship when we don't feel seen? So we see the other, we try to see the other, we want to be seen, we need to be seen. And we also need to want to see ourselves. 
How, how am I in this relationship? I'm interacting. What's going on for me? What are my intentions? What are my feelings? So we see ourselves too, and that's equally important. And we'll talk about what is friendship? What makes good friendship? We appreciate the other in a friendship. There's appreciation for who they are, for how they are, for their what they do, for their manifestation. And hopefully there's the willingness and the ability to express that. And this is something we all need to look into. Am I do I hold back my voicing of appreciation in in, in, in the relationships that I'm in? How easy it is to get into that pattern. I'm just a little bit inhibited in doing that. And conversely, again, we take <coughs> we take in appreciation. And again, this is a very interesting one. How many of us is it actually quite difficult? We have someone who loves us, and they're expressing appreciation. So some wall comes up over the heart. Just can't take it in. It just bounces right off. How common this is. And again, to appreciate oneself. To appreciate oneself. All this is, is part of what friendship is. And part of, you know, rather I would say friendship is the commitment to growing in all of that and to, to uncovering all of that, to discovering all of that. So there is, I think it's fair to say, there's a kind of level of practice or a dimension of practice that's really about reparenting ourselves. You know, sometimes, I mean, that's a way of putting it, sometimes for some people, literally the parents did not provide uh, enough of what was needed. And there is, in a way, a very real reparenting that goes on very gradually over months and years. And that's, that's one of the functions, not totally not the complete practice. It's one of the functions of practice, this reparenting. So sometimes we can hear some of the teachings or read some of the suttas and they talk about loving kindness and this boundlessness of it and the unconditionality of it. And it can seem a little unreal or unrealistic. It's a bit too squeaky clean. Like the, the, the you know, squeaky clean meta machine. It's just, it somehow doesn't feel very human. Sometimes some of the some of the references, and there's a way that it can feel like it excludes or precludes our personality, our self-expression, our uniqueness. So this this is really important. It doesn't. The manifestations of loving kindness, the expressions, the intentions of loving kindness very much include our particular uniqueness and our particular self expression. It's very human, very personal. And yesterday night John talked about anatta, this teaching of not self, the emptiness of self. And there is yesterday he, he approached it via the aggregates, the five aggregates. There are many ways to approach it. It's very interesting. We have a sense of me, my personality, my individuality. The question dharmically is not that that shouldn't be there, that we shouldn't have a sense of our individuality and our uniqueness. It's rather, is the way that I'm regarding my personality, my uniqueness, my individuality, is the way I'm holding that leading to suffering for me and suffering to others? Am I over-identified? Am I wrapped too tight in my self-definitions and my self-views, believing I'm like this and needing that affirmed all the time, or too rigid? Am I wrapped up in that self-view? If I am, then it's going to cause problems for, for self and for other. Is there another way of looking at Actually, there are many other ways of looking at it. One is that this in, in this, in this case, this particular individuality, this particular self-expression, this particular uniqueness, is the result of an infinite web, completely inextricable web of conditions in the present and reaching far back into the past. So just this body, 
genetically from the parents and the whole sort of uh, you know mil- millennium, multi millions, billions of years recess, actually right back to the Big Bang, and the evolution of matter and then the genetic uh, passing on this body, and then this body nourished by air, nourished by food, nourished by sunlight. This makes this particular expression of the body, like it or not. Personality, everything that I've read, all the relationships I've had, all the interactions, all the music I've loved, all of that goes to make this particular unique expression right now, this moment right now. And there's a way that the self and the very individuality and uniqueness of the self is inextricably bound up with actually everything else in the whole universe. Everything else in the whole universe. We have a delusion of separateness. Can we practice, and this is a really important word, practice, because we can kind of understand this intellectually, can we practice reversing that delusion and actually seeing another way, seeing in terms of this, this web? So part of what practice means is playing with ways of looking, shaking things up, saying, let me look at this another way, let me practice looking at this another way, until that other way, which brings freedom with it, which brings love with it, becomes much more accessible, much more normal for us. So the, the kind of realistic messiness of what meta means and looks like in our lives, you know, in terms of our personalities and in terms of how, how, it, how we are with others, how we are in our friendships, how we are in our relationships, all of them. So this is really a question for us as practitioners. Are we really willing, fully willing, to work with that messiness in our lives? to work with that complexity, to work with our humanity in the context of our friendships, of our relationships. And sometimes we think we are, but but if we take a real honest look, the, the truth is, well, there's a lot of places that we just mm, she can't really be bothered to go there. Are we willing to work with the fullness of our, our life and have, a, in, in that sense, a very full practice? There's very beautiful passage from Khalil Gibran, the, the prophet. I'm sure some of you know this. And he's talking about friendship. And he says, And a youth said, Speak to us of friendship. And he answered, saying, Your friend is your needs answered. He is your field which you sow with love and reap with thanksgiving. And he is your board and your fireside. For you come to him with your hunger and you seek him for peace. When your friend speaks his mind, you fear not the nay in your own mind, nor do you withhold the yes. And when he is silent, your heart ceases not to listen to his heart. For without words, in friendship, all thoughts, all desires, All expectations are born and shared with joy that is unacclaimed. When you part from your friend, you grieve not, for that which you love most in him may be clearer in his absence, as the mountain to the climber is clearer from the plain. And let there be no purpose in friendship save the deepening of the spirit, For love that seeks anything but the disclosure of its own mystery is not love, but a net cast forth, and only the unprofitable is caught. And let your best be for your friend. If he must know the ebb of your tide, let him know its flood also. For what is your friend that you should seek him with hours to kill? Seek him always with hours to live. For it is his to fill your need, but not your emptiness. And in the sweetness of friendship, let there be laughter and sharing of pleasures. For in the dew of little things, the heart finds its morning and is refreshed. Very beautiful. 
So there is the self, the benefactor, the friend. Tomorrow we introduce the neutral, the neutral category, the category of people that feel neutral to us, not particularly for or against. This is very interesting. Can be at that point in the practice. This is where we just <laughs> the the very neutrality means they're not. There's nothing in it for us. It becomes a bit abstract. We lose interest. It feels removed, but that effect in itself is actually quite interesting. What is it that makes us lose interest in people? What is it that makes them makes most of humanity, perhaps, for some, it's interesting, for some people no one's neutral. There's always some kind of tussle, but what is it that allows people to kind of fade to the background for us? A very interesting question. When we're struggling with something, when consciousness is struggling with something, we're in a tizzy about something, either wanting to get rid of something, pushing something away, or trying to hold on to something, trying to grasp. When there's clinging, in Dharma shorthand, when there's clinging, the more clinging there is, the more the sense of self. And what one has then is a very prominent sense of self and a prominent sense of one thing that one's in a bit of a tizzy about. So self and cl- clinging build self. This is another way of saying self is empty. It depends on our clinging. It depends on us struggling with something in some way. The more we struggle, the more built up the self is. And you have the self and you have one thing with which one is clinging or grasping to some degree. And everything else, everyone else, just fades. Not interested right now. You've got the self and this thing feeding each other The more thing, the more self, the more self, the more thing. Clinging is building that process. Everyone else fades to grey. Not interested. We really need to see this. We really need to see this process. What's happening? How is it that self gets built up, a thing gets built up, and everyone else can kind of go to... (laughs) Doesn't... Does it make sense? Did that make sense? Yeah. Very, very important to see this. As I said, there's many ways into this anatta business. And to see the emptiness. Self is something that's built. We fabricate it. We need to huff and puff and and blow the house up, actually. We need to construct it. And we, we can actually see this going on. And then we see what that does to the love. See what it does to the uh, expansiveness of the love. It basically shrinks. So there's self, friend, benefactor, neutral. And as I said, there's there's a difficult category. And sometimes, in fact, the friend, as I said, can can find themselves in the difficult category, the category of person with whom we have difficulty. Now this, I think, is a really interesting area, a really important area for us to look at. What loving-kindness is not, absolutely is not, is making us doormats that people wipe their feet over and and walk all over and basically treat uh, badly. It's not doing that. It's not designed to do that. It's not about being Pollyanna or whatever the phrase is. So in the context of this, when we have difficulty with someone, whether they were a friend or it's just someone on the street that we don't know, whatever it is, it's actually important to look and, and really with care investigate our relationship to expressing anger, expressing no. Are we able to do that? First of all, are we able to do that? Are we willing to do that? Are we able to do it skillfully? These, these are you know, hard challenges for us. So it may be that expressing anger and expressing a no is actually a part of what metta is. It's actually in that moment what metta looks like. You understand that it's the most loving thing to do and the most healthy thing to do to, to express a no or express anger in a way that's helpful. So
sometimes, and this again is quite common, there's a real fear of doing that, fear of saying no, a fear of standing in one's truth and speaking it, fear of expressing anger. Very common. I have a, a very good friend who suffers from quite severe depression at times. And she's beginning to notice this relationship. It's only part of what goes on for her, and, and depression itself is quite complex, so this is only a strand. But she's beginning to notice that there are times when something happens with someone and she's angry. Something <coughs> goes on that she's really angry about, and she feels so fearful of expressing the anger. She's just beginning to be aware of this now. She turns it in on herself. Next thing she knows, she's in a, in a state of depression, which is one of the possibilities of, of what can happen here. And in her case, it's, it's kind of doubly tragic because I feel that she's someone with a very natural, um, very naturally, very deep metta and compassion. And every time this happens... Uh, and depression comes on, it just closes down her ability to express that and to, to offer that to others and to herself. Interesting too, terrible phrase, but spiritual types, which actually includes all of us, the kind of people <laughs> <laughs> that are in this room right now, <laughs> oftentimes there's a real no-no with anger. It's it's really like we, we there's a real recoiling from it, a real fear of it, a real assumption that it's really a no-go area. But just to check where one's patterns are with this, am I the kind of person that uh, goes around barking at people and biting their heads off very quickly, or am I really reluctant to express that? Where, where do I fall in this, to know oneself? And it's a very interesting question with anger. And not, I think this is another of the areas, not to be too quick to jump to conclusions. Never express it, or you always need to express exactly what's going on. I think it's completely fair to say there's too much anger in the world. There's too much violence. It's too, it's too much out there. With all the consequences. But it's really worth our investigating. So I'm talking now about investigating anger and expressing anger as actually one of the faces of loving kindness can be can be anger is interesting when we really look at it and when we're really honest with it it's usually blind and it's usually blind in three ways it's usually blind to its causes so usually something happens we get angry and we say you are making me angry, or this is making me angry. And what we don't see in that, it seems so obvious, what we don't see is the whole inner constellation, both inner and outer, constellation of conditions that allow the anger to be. All kinds of assumptions, perceptions, views, thoughts. What was the state of mind before the anger? Perhaps there was a little bit of irritability in leaning that way anyway. Anger comes and it's, it becomes blind to its causes and, believe, and wants to put it on one thing. The Dharma practice means to uncover that. Blind to its causes, also often blind to its effects. Anger is blind to its effects. So both energetically and on others. I'll explain what I mean. And when was it? 20, more than 20, around 20 years ago, I had just started uh, a psychotherapy process, working in, in psychotherapy with a therapist in America. And it was quite early days. And she said, and it seemed clear, there's obviously some anger there, needs addressing, needs to come out, get it out. And so she suggested uh, go to the gym and get one of those big punch bags and pummel, pummel, pummel the punch bag and be with that process of the anger expressing itself. So I dutifully did that uh, for quite a while. That's huge. <laughs> and what I noticed was that I would 
punch this thing and anger would indeed come up and I would punch away at it really hard. What happened was the more I punched and the more into it I got, the more anger came up. I thought, ah, oh, now we're really liberating some stuff. <laughs> and, and I went, I'm really, really going for it. And I was quite young. Going to the extent that my knuckle, I was actually wearing boxing gloves, uh, but my knuckles were still bleeding underneath. Really, so I was a very um, eager client. And uh, <laughs> after a certain point, something occurred to me. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> this is actually building it and not releasing it, which would be the assumption. S- anger can be blind to its effects. What's going on? We tend to think there's such a pressure inside, it needs to release, I need to get it out. It's like a heat, a burning. Get it out. And then when I get it out, I feel better, even if we don't consciously think that. Is that the case? Always. It can be blind to its effects. It can also be blind to its effects on others. So again, we say, we voice our anger, we vent and, our anger at someone, and really what we want is for the situation to change, or part of what we want. And yet, I think it takes an extraordinarily evolved human being to have anger flung at them, energetically, that, that level of anger, and not to react just energetically. It's such a strong energy for human beings. We're very sensitive, very vulnerable, fragile beings, energetically. Someone takes a very evolved person practicing very hard (laughs) to, to just hear that and say, you know, no reaction, I hear, you know, and, and just to respond and not react. Because blind anger can be blind to its effects on others. Blind to itself as well, in the third blindness. In terms of anger, often it feels like it's so clear that we're just striking through things with the, you know, the wisdom sword of Manjushri. And we're seeing exactly what's happening. And the Buddha likened a- angry mind to a water that's boiling. You actually can't see anything underneath. It's just raging away. So part of practice is to really be honest about this and and about these blindnesses and and explore them. Oftentimes, when we feel anger, it feels a lot easier to vent it. And it might feel easier in the moment, but in the long run it's not. It's really not. What am I building when I vent anger? What am I crystallizing and conditioning in myself and in the relationship and in others? It, again, this is one of these quite complex issues, so I just want to, in a way, open it up. <coughs> is it possible to feel anger, to feel the anger, and to express it in a way that the person does not feel dumped on, vomited on, flung at? And some, some of you may be familiar with just to say, I feel angry. I, I, f- I feel angry. It's very different from just ranting at someone. One is taking ownership instead of hurling or dumping the feelings on another. Big difference in effect. Now, that's not easy, and there's no way that I think anyone realistically would say that's easy. It's very challenging. And this whole area of communication, and particularly communicating what's difficult in our relationships, how much of the difficulty we have in relationships is around our lack of skill and care and consciousness around communication. Such a huge area, we could easily have a whole Dharma talk, a whole day just on that. And the Buddha, just a little piece, the Buddha said, when there's something difficult to communicate to another, that one speaks what is true, if it's helpful. In other words, if you feel that the person can really hear it and can learn from it. What's true and helpful in a helpful way, skillfully, and this is a practice, what's true and helpful in a helpful way at the right time. (laughs) So it's quite... (laughs) It's quite... uh, I think it's just a practice. It's really a practice. And of all the precepts, all the five precepts, it's the hardest one. It's, It's such an art, such a skill... 
and a way to learn to hold back and to do it in the right way, in a helpful way. I think, and I know for myself, and I see it in others, that this is really a learning process. Again, that word practice, it's a practice. It's going to take time. So if I think back for myself, again, going back 20 years or more, wasn't even aware of when I felt angry, and then uh, didn't connect with it, and then afraid or unable to communicate that to others, and then learnt gradually willing to try and do that, but went way over the other side. So I, I basically dropped you know, nucle- small thermonuclear devices on, on the people, <laughs> really going overboard. It was part of the learning process. And luckily I could say sorry in a lot of cases, but it actually fractured a lot of relationships. And again, it was coming out of, in a way, in, uh, wanting to be earnest and wanting to address what was actually an imbalance in myself and wanting to be honest and wanting to stand in the truth. And yet it was, it was so difficult to do that in a way that was balanced. So we're going to make mistakes, and I think that's okay. Or we neglect to say something when we actually should have. A while ago, some can't remember when it was, I had a situation that went on with someone, and I felt quite upset uh, by what was going on. I can't actually remember what it was now, but anyway. Um, (laughs) And I remember asking to speak with this person, and the first thing I said when I went in to speak with her was, I really want you to know my intention is not to hurt. I I really don't want to hurt in, in what I'm saying, and I don't want to retaliate. It may be that what I'm saying doesn't come out perfectly. I still feel agitated and upset a little bit, and I, I, I don't know if I can say it perfectly, so please just bear that in mind and excuse that. But please, please know my intention is not to hurt. And in a way I felt that was really helpful, just the first thing, saying that, setting up, uh, setting up a kind of context uh, of non-harming, setting up the intention setting up also the humanity of it. So I could be human, I could be less than perfect, which actually also invited her, or allowed her to be less than perfect, to be human. That's something that felt very, very helpful to do that at the time. Now, of course, if one does something like that, you have to make sure that you you really don't have an intention to hurt. You can't just go in there saying, yeah, I don't intend to hurt, and then, you know, you've got your... (laughs) (laughs) So to take, sometimes it takes time sitting with it, a couple of minutes, a couple of hours, a couple of days, a couple of weeks or more, sitting with something that really hurts, until we be working with the anger, being with the anger, teasing out what's there, the hurt underneath, etc., the sadness, until we feel pretty sure that we can go in there and there's very, very little intention to hurt or retaliate or be the one who's right or whatever it is. And, and then, then we're much more ready to have that conversation. So all this is very challenging. Sometimes we find ourselves in relationship on the receiving end of anger. Someone is angry at us for what we've done or not done or whatever it is. And then it's a whole skill to hear anger. And this is very interesting too. Again, if I think back, I used to be a person, when when people were angry with me, again, and it, I, I feel it looking back, and I'm sure many others share this, it ca- was coming out of a kind of earnestness, you know, and really wanting to look at my faults and see where I could grow and open and transform. So someone was angry at me and would hurl their anger or just go... You know, sort of back in the 80s when it was really, you know, that was the way to do it. <laughs> At least in America it was. Um, <laughs> um, and what I would do out of earnestness was completely open up energetically, yeah, give it to me. 
because I really wanted to be totally honest and totally open and totally take in what was being said. Maybe I could learn something about myself. Maybe I could. Maybe there really was something that I needed to be honest about and get to the bottom of and transform. And what I found with with that was basically I I was ke- keeled over. I mean, energetic. In some instances, I, I remember it would take weeks to recover. I mean, it's so strong. Uh, the the energetic effect, and then I remember a teacher, Michael, at a I can't remember what it was, a day retreat or an evening class or something. And he said, "You know, we're not obliged to take on or open ourselves to, or even stick around for someone's energy of rage, energy of anger." And I heard that and my jaw you know hung seemed completely radical to me but and what he was saying was you could say to a person i really see that you're angry and i really want to hear what it is that you're upset about and i really want to hear what's going on but i'm not prepared to take on that energy i'm not i'm not going to do that i'm not going to open myself to that so when you feel able to just tell me that, you know, in a, in a way that's more calm, uh, then I'm ready to listen. So maybe, you know, go for a walk or whatever. Now, of course, the person's probably going <laughs> to go through the roof. So I think there has to be some... Yes, exactly. But there has to be some skin in the same. But I think the point is actually quite interesting. And again, I'm sure I'm not alone in, 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 in that pattern. So I'm voicing it. But I'm sure I'm not alone in that pattern of out of earnestness opening oneself up to that do we open ourselves up to listening to what the person has to say yes the energy the rage that 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 violence why anger often comes person is often angry people uh, individuals political groups socioeconomic groups ethnic groups often angry because they feel unheard Unheard. How much at the root of anger is a feeling of being unheard and a feeling of, uh, from that, of powerlessness. The person's not hearing me and I can't do anything about it. Feeling of frustration with that. Feeling of hurt. That we feel hurt and it's not being heard. So individually or with groups. I think in a situation that's difficult, and and again, none of this is easy at all, but in a situation like that, when one person can say to the other, uh, can look and see the hurt that's underneath the anger, and then express to the other person genuine feeling, it it really pains me, I feel really, I feel sad that I hurt you. And there's something's going underneath, just this clashing at the surface. And in a way, someone, when two people are like that, someone has to has to do that. Someone has to be the one that 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 takes the risk and 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 is vulnerable and expresses that and softens. Someone has to show their hurt. Not easy, but if that doesn't happen, well, we all know what it just keeps battering at that same level. And somehow to say to someone, I'm 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 really pains me that I hurt you. So, loving kindness and all through the categories as it opens up. Talking a lot about, or I've been talking a lot about the body and the importance of the body in loving kindness. And say a bit more about this. Can there be for us here, now, on this retreat, can there begin to be, can we encourage, can we nurture a gentleness and a care that runs through the body and runs through the bodily expression? Today, tonight, the rest of the retreat, through this retreat. So you may want to explore this a bit. I feel this is a very important aspect of metta. It's not just about sitting and, and, say, you know, grinding through the phrases and mumbling away to yourself. (laughs) 
sometimes I forget the tape records. <laughs> um, can we begin to explore, this is an option, can we begin to explore a tenderness of touch for ourselves? So this might sound a little, I don't know, hokey for some people or embarrassing, but what would it be, and we've all got single rooms here, so it's fine to do it in you, what would it be... <laughs> to actually begin to explore. It's just an option to explore touching the body with tenderness. What is it? One hand touches the other hand. And through the hand, in the touch, through the touch, there's tenderness there. You can actually feel it. And one part of the body is expressing to the other tenderness. Hand on the arm, hand on the chest, hand on the belly. Just feel into that and imagine it. Just feel the tenderness moving through the body. Play with it as a practice if, if you want to. I, th- I feel it's very important when we're standing outside or doing the walking meditation outside. And again, some of this you may have uncovered anyway. Walking, walking meditation, the foot touches the earth. And actually, there can be a kiss there. There can be love somehow felt, tenderness, beauty felt between foot and earth. This, this is available to us, something we can explore, something we can play with. So to experiment with this, what are the ways that the metta can open up and, and flow through the body, through the eyes? And there's, a, there's ways of looking that are imbued with loving kindness. In, in a way, attention and love go very closely together. So how often is it that someone needing love, what what they really need, and they come to us, and what they really need is our attention, and, our, and the fullness of our attention, the softness of our attention, and through that very attention, that's actually all they need, need to be heard, need to be seen, need to be held in that attention. The looking itself expresses the love, carries the love, and can be with each other here, can be with nature, trees, to look at a tree with that. What is it? Play with this, possibly, if you want. And again, here, as said on the opening night, I think, no hurry, nothing to hurry for here. To really slow down. In a way, that slowing down can also open up this tenderness uh, that flows through the body. So to stomping down the corridor, slamming doors and clunking cutlery, you know, it's all. Of course, it's all fine. It's no problem with any of that. But can there actually be, through all these little movements, little interactions, there's actually the tenderness running through? Experiment with it. Touch the handle of a door. There's somehow the tenderness flowing through that. Can be. Sometimes this slow hurry thing in its relationship with life is actually easier to see outside, uh, off retreat. So if I know, if I go to Newton Abbott, and uh, not saying anything about Newton Abbott. But if I go to Newton Abbott and I've got an agenda of things to do, you know, a list, and I've got a limited amount of time, and I'm hurrying through the high street, got to go to the bank, got to go to the uh, chemist, got to do the, whatever. And somehow, in the very hurrying, the leaning forward, and I'm going through Newton Abbott with my little summary of what I want, this sort of on the, on, on the sheet of paper, and that very what I want, basically clinging, encapsulated on a piece of paper. <laughs> What happens? Again, everyone on the street is just people in the way. They're just other, other in the way. Versus, and I, you know, this is actually part of life nowadays to, to have to be in a hurry, but um, versus sometimes being there and dropping that a little bit and maybe still getting the stuff done. Dropping that what I want. You can play with this. What happens when you're moving in the hustle, the bustle, the busyness of... Newton Abbott High Street, wherever it is. And you've just dropped that. A possibility for a wider sense of mystery of being to come in, and in that, a wider sense of love. And one sees there's life going on, it's life expressing itself. And children moving, and old people, and... Um, interactions with shopkeepers and business transactions and it's all just expressing itself and dogs and whatever it is 
life expressing itself. And there is an opening of the heart to that. Can be even small example, but very pertinent to what we're doing here. Come on retreat. I want to get concentrated. Too tight in the what I want. And what's the downside? Irritability. Someone just breathes a little bit too loudly <laughs> next to you, and, and there's irritability there, or the radiator makes a noise, or whatever it is. Heart's closing. So again, what I want and clinging, and the struggle with all that uh, is related to the opening the closing of the heart. On any retreat, on this retreat, there is a possibility, as, as, as we deepen, as time goes on, to begin slowing down, but also to begin relaxing this struggle with experience, pushing away what we don't like, pulling towards us what we like, and this what I want so much. And through relaxing that, it's possible that a stillness comes gradually into the being, just gradually into the being. The body, the being, in a very unforced way, begins to feel more and more still, very non-linear. And also a silence inside. And the outer silence can begin to become more prominent. As there's more stillness in the being and more silence, a couple of things, a number of things can happen. One of them is that our sense of priority gets much clearer. So the usual stuff that we're caught up in as feeling very important in our everyday bustle begins to just settle. And what's most important, what's most deeply important to us, which may be the absolute necessity of love, the, the, the wish to surrender to loving kindness, to opening compassion, what's deeply important to us comes more and more to the fore, becomes prominent in consciousness. It's something that comes out of the stillness and silence. Another thing, another f- aspect that can come up f- in, in a way because of the stillness but, and the silence, but also because of the metta, is memories of things that we've done or not done that we regret. So, And with that, we remember we said this, we did this, we didn't, we, whatever it was. And the pain of the memory, how easily that can move into guilt and just wrapped around repeating the memory and the pain of that. This is a natural part, of, I, I think, of doing a meta-retreat and also of just being in silence for a while. It will allow this stuff to come to the surface. A distinction between guilt and remorse. I don't know if this is dictionary definitions, but guilt, I, I would say, is when we remember something, we don't feel good about it, and the self defines itself around it. It's making a conclusion about what we did, making a conclusion about, about the self, rather. We did this, or we didn't do this, and it's saying, ah, therefore I am bad. Do you understand? Are we still here? <laughs> Does that make sense? Guilt is, is making a conclusion about the self. Remorse, I would say, is making a conclusion about the action. So guilt has a way of making definitions and binding oneself in a definition of the self. I'm bad, I'm useless, I'm a failure, I'm not a good person. Remorse is saying, in in the future, I'd rather not act that way. I want to choose something different. Saying something about the action, it's forward-looking, creative, open whereas guilt is backward-looking and, and just stays around the self. Did that make sense? Do I need to open the window a little bit? As we let go more, 
the sense of stillness and sense of silence can begin to deepen, can begin to deepen for some people, and can begin to become very prominent. The actual sense of silence, so-called inner, so-called outer, begins to become more and more prominent, can begin to become more prominent. And it's almost as if the silence takes on uh, a fabric of itself, a meaning of itself, almost a mystical sense of silence can open up. That can have everything to do with with love. It's almost as if the silence holds love in it. There's a beautiful poem by Pablo Neruda, which again, some of you will know this. It's called Keeping Quiet. (coughs) Now we will count to twelve, and we'll all keep quiet. For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment, without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the man gathering salt would look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it is about. I want no truck with death. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could do nothing, Perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us, as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. Now I'll count up to twelve, and you keep quiet, and I will go. The more letting go there is, the more this sense of silence for some people can become prominent and can have a kind of love in it. Usual human consciousness is preoccupied with things, events, things that happen inside or outside. And that can begin to just die down a little bit and there's a sense of something other in and through the silence. can be for some people. And in that silence, for some people, sometimes, it's almost as if the metta becomes something that we are held in, that we receive. This silence that seems to permeate the universe has love in it. Everything, our being, everything that comes up is held in that, held in that love. So usually when we do the metta, we have a sense of me doing it. Uh, There's self and there's effort involved in the phrases and we're creating this metta. But again, talking about aspects of metta, facets of metta, it's not always like that. And there are other ways that it can reveal itself. And so for some people, the whole way that we're going about it with phrases, etc., is not the way that's most helpful. For some people, much more devotional practice, using uh, Green Tara, Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara, Jesus, beings, uh, archetypal beings of great love, tuning into them, devoting oneself to them, and, and receiving, in a way, the love that way. It's not always that metta feels is coming from the self, When, or if, there's this sense of silence, it's actually not that uncommon. I have a friend who, for years, never did any practice. Uh, very sporadic, kind of flirting with different practices. And she was working somewhere one day and went to get lunch in a restaurant. And she said, just suddenly, she felt like she was sitting inside God's love. And the whole restaurant was, it was her words, inside God's love. And she said, why isn't anyone talking about this? 
why are they all pretending it's not happening? <laughs> but it was interesting because it didn't come out of any particular practice or anything. It just sort of spontaneously arose. But this is something that is much more likely to come out of practice. It's as if something is unveiled. Some quality of, of the universe is unveiled. I got a lovely note from a yogi a while ago, not, not on this retreat, but we were working on metta together. And it's expressing this. And she said, Dear Rob, practicing after the meeting in the library, an old, well-known, apparently insoluble pain arose very quickly. Already aware that there wasn't any wholehearted acceptance, yet an attempt to embrace the pain lovingly, coming from a hidden agenda of wanting it to go away, to dissolve. Somehow it was clear that this unloving attitude was known to the pain, and so it wouldn't pass but intensify. What was needed was very clearly a pure embrace of loving-kindness, breathing to expand the capacity of accepting the unacceptable and relax. So she was working with the breath as with, with her metta. Breathing to expand the capacity to love the unloved and relax. And then a change. Deep, pitch black darkness, familiar though, was around. And the thought was even the unloved is surrounded by love all the time anyway. And it went on. We all are surrounded, loved all the time anyway. We may not know, we may not have experienced it yet, but love is around all along, awaiting us to open up to it, to become sensitive to it, to receive it. With all our incompetence, imperfection, impurities, we are surrounded by love nonetheless. If that is so, doesn't it bring with it a kind of responsibility, as it were, to expand our capacity to love unconditionally. As human beings, we are never able to embrace unconditional love. It always embraces us, always has, and always will. Is that true? Question. How can love appear as dark black? Isn't it said and written umpteen times it comes as light? Am I experiencing a hoax? (laughs) <laughs> she's very lovely and I told her she wasn't of course but uh, English isn't even her first language very beautiful but this is a sense I'm just pointing out again different aspects of the, the way the meta can, can appear and manifest and be so some will relate to that some may or may not have had the experience will or will not it's not that important just pointing out a range but it may be something that comes up What's more significant is the fact of perceptions changing. The heart opens and perceptions change. Perceptions open. Our perception of the world, our perception of the universe, our perception of the fabric of being begins to change. That's actually much more significant than it seems at first. Much, much more significant. Last point. I mentioned in the instructions the other day, sometimes we have a moment where there's a feeling of metta, there's the warmth or whatever it is there, and we feel that. And sometimes that feeling actually becomes quite relatively steady. And then we can let the phrases go if that feels helpful. We can just let the phrases go and be with that feeling and just give ourselves to that feeling and enjoy it and open to it and, and feel into the texture of it, radiate it, and let the phrases go. And sometimes that can deepen and we have, we may be directing the love towards the friend or whoever it is, the neutral benefactor. And it seems at first that there was a person here and a person there, and the love is moving towards them. It can deepen, and it's almost like the the sense of the person begins to blur a bit, and there's just a sense of two hearts and a flow, a radiation between the two hearts, and even that can deepen and can can become, at times, a sense of a kind of communion of hearts. There's just really one heart, one consciousness, imbued with love. Beautiful possibility, not forever, but for a moment, for a stretch of time. 
again, not to snatch at any of this, I'm just saying what, what can come sometimes in the practice. And in that communion of hearts, a sense of oneness, is it really separate? Is it really separate? So oneness is actually something different from anatta, what John talked about yesterday. But it's still very important. It's extremely important. Our usual sense of things is separateness, is not oneness. I'm here, you're there. Separate things, separate beings, separate selves. And to begin, in a way, opening ourselves, getting a taste of some other sense, sense of oneness. It's not an ultimate truth, but it's extremely important, extremely beautiful opening. And again, it can be that a person goes in and out of that kind of experience many times. And the more significant thing, rather than staying in a sense of oneness, which is not ultimately true, the more significant thing is actually the question, what is true? Typical unenlightened consciousness assumes separate self to be true. It's just, it's a given, it's obvious. Or then we might assume oneness to be true. What's true? And we qu- begin to question our taken for granted perceptions of separation that we completely take for granted without even thinking about it, that everything's separate. Through the change of perceptions, that's possible sometimes, we question our perceptions, and in that, beginning to go deeper into truth. Why don't we sit together for a couple of minutes? Mm -hmm. 